All right, Galatians chapter 3. We're going to do this chapter now. And uh, we're going to start out here in verse 1. It's always a good place to start, you know. But uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Um, o foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? What's the purpose of somebody bewitching a Christian? To turn them away from the truth. And of course, you know, that happened in the first century, but it doesn't happen anymore today. There's no bewitchment going on. Wrong. But let me ask you a question. Is it possible for saved Christians to be bewitched? Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines bewitched as fascinated or charmed. Hmm. Have you ever been fascinated by a preacher? He really puts on a good performance, you know? It's fascinating. He's very charming, you know? Hmm. Acts chapter 8, verse 9 through 11 says here, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. He's a great preacher of the Lord. He's a man of God. Did you ever hear that? The great power of God? Verse 11. And to him they had regard because of that, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Notice how the two words are used interchangeably. Sorcery and bewitchment. And sorcery is defined as magic, enchantment, witchcraft, divination by the assistance of evil spirits. Hmm, that's interesting. The Bible says about the time, or uh, in latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Hmm, interesting. They have a divination by the assistance of evil spirits, or the power of commanding evil spirits. Adder's wisdom, and I have learned to fence my ears against the sorceries. Again, that's Webster's 1828 dictionary of the word sorcery. But very interesting there. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. And I go over these verses, like I said, I, I always say this. I go over these a lot because they're so key. They're so central to understanding things. And a lot of times you read them and you don't see how they line up with certain verses until you go over them again. But look at this. Romans 16, verse 17 and 18 now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Hmm. The simple. Those that really don't know the word of God, the new converts, are just easy prey for these wicked false prophets. That will deceive people. Hmm. Interesting. But how they how do they deceive? They deceive with good words and fair speeches. Okay. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 3 says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple, the simple, you know, pass on and are punished. Okay, now that's talking about evil in the world and things, but you can also use it for instruction in righteousness and realize when you start to understand the Bible and you start to actually see a lot of these false movements, movements and how they work, you will start to be able to tell certain key words. And you go, whoa, wait a second here. I know what this guy's going to. You know, I'll give you a couple examples. Some guy, you hear some guy and he's preaching and he says, I believe in the sovereignty of God and that God has a special election of people who will be saved. And you go, uh-oh, wait a second, Calvinist. You get another guy and he says, I just think that, that Christians would have more power if they would receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh-oh, charismatic. See, you get some other guy and he says, you know, I just believe in unity. I just think that we all need to start getting along and better and this stuff. And, you know, I really don't care what denomination you're part of. And, and I really don't care, you know. I mean, even Catholics and Protestants, I mean, we, we can find issues that we agree on. Uh-oh. Ecumenical, one-worlder. See? You, the prudent man foresees the evil and you hide yourself. You get away from it. There in, in uh, 
Romans chapter 16, it says about to avoid them. Mark them and avoid them. Get away from them. You foresee the evil and you say, whoa, I'm hiding myself from that guy. I don't want any, anything to do with him. You know? But what happens? The simple pass on and are destroyed. The simple just go, oh, I think he's wonderful. He reads out of the King James Bible, so he must be right. See? And it's going to take you a long time. If you're a new convert, it's going to take you a long time to learn all the right things and, and learn how to discern this stuff. This just doesn't happen like that. Okay? But one of the easiest ways that you can tell somebody who is trying to bewitch you, to draw you in and to control you, it will always appear with their voice. Okay? Okay? Let me give you three examples. First of all, you have a carnival voice. Okay? What's a carnival voice? Now, friends, let me tell you, you can turn in the Bible. The Word of God is the thing that challenges us in our day-to-day -day lives. And we can know for a fact that we are saved by the precious blood of the Lord. Why do you have to talk like that? Why does a preacher have to modulate his voice and sound like a car salesman? Why? See? Why? He's trying to bewitch you. Remember what it said there about Simon the sorcerer there? It said that uh, they said this man is the great power of God. And you listen to a lot of these big name preachers and stuff. They will bewitch the people with that carnival voice. They'll do it. Number two, good words and fair speeches. Friends, I'm, I'm so very happy that you've tuned in today. And, and just to see the, the wisdom that all of my viewers have out there and, and the discernment that you all have and, and the fact that, that God is using you in such a mighty way. Uh huh. You see, I just want to share this with you today from the Word of God. And, and I think that you will be intelligent enough to understand this because you're, you, my viewers, are so smart and whoa, stay away, <laughs> you know, some guy, a, a real preacher should talk plain, okay, when I do my videos, I do not take, you know, multiple takes and stuff like that, I'll, I'll mess up, I'll say things stupid and things like that, that's what you're going to get, why, I'm real, I'm real, those who have ever talked to me or, or met me in person, they'll tell you, yeah, that's, Brian's the same way in person as he is when he's behind the camera, I don't put on any airs. I don't put on any special words or I don't come with, with enticing words of men's wisdom. You know, I don't do that. It's just, I am what I am. That's all the way, or that's that's all there is to it. Okay? As I've, of, I've often said, you know, I have a hard time with the English language and people say, what's your native language? I say, English. <laughs> you know, not highly educated. Sorry if you're looking to worship me. It's, I'm not a good one to worship. Jesus is, though. So, But uh, another type of, uh, the third type of um, bewitchment that people will use is they will scream. They'll yell. Now, I'm not going to do this. So I'm not going to put on an act because it, it just makes me end up coughing and messes my throat up. But you get some guy and he's just yelling about everything out there and just yelling and raising his voice and stuff. You know, okay, if some guy raises his voice when he's angry about something, gets mad, okay, fine. But when you get some guy and he's just screaming at you and screaming and screaming and screaming when he's preaching, he's trying to bewitch you. That is another form of the carnival preaching thing. You know, look at the way Adolf Hitler, you know, listen to my sermon at Carnival Preachers. Look at the way Adolf Hitler controlled the crowds and then listen to professional wrestlers and then listen to a lot of preachers. They're using the same tactics. You don't need to modulate your voice and change your voice and, and make your get all worked up and things like that. That is somebody who is trying to bewitch their hearers, the listeners. And that's what was happening here to these Galatians. And Paul didn't say, oh, you know, you Galatians. He said, oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? That's what happens. You're foolish because you let somebody bewitch you, and they turn you away from the truth. Be very careful. Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 through 4. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? 
are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain. Okay. Here's the weird thing. Religion, you know, people say, oh, he got religion or, you know, he's, he's religious now or whatever. Religion can actually make you more fleshly and carnal. What you do is you get somebody who's very fleshly. They smoke, they drink, they're, you know, just very wicked and whatever else. And they get, they go and they become part of some organized religion somewhere. All of a sudden they're no, they're cleaning themselves up and everything else. But they can get to a point of, of such high level of religious fanaticism that they actually become fleshly and carnal in the wrong direction. And that's what's going on here with these Galatian believers. Okay, let me give you a couple examples. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus actually says that the Pharisees there and the scribes are righteous. They had righteousness. They had these great standards of righteousness. These men were very self-sacrificial. They were very, you know, pious and devout. Kind of like a lot of Catholic priests out there. There are Catholic, especially like monks, you get into some of the orders of the monks and things like that. They'll shave their heads a certain way and they'll wear coarse woolen garments. And they'll, I mean, they'll, they'll suffer, really, truly suffer. Of course, it's just to merit their salvation. They're lost and on their way to hell. It's a rather stupid thing that they're doing. But that those convictions that they have, those uh, standards, I should say, not, well, kind of convictions, I guess, but those standards that they have, it's actually to exalt the flesh. They're foolish people. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. I'll read a couple verses here. If you want to go to Matthew chapter 6, you'll see this thing here about... Uh, how these religious people a lot of times are hypocrites. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Take heed that ye knew not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in their synagogues, or in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest thine alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. You know, it's kind of like you go to into some, you know, Babel building someplace, and they have these, you know, this wall, you know, and stuff, and they have blocks of carpet, and who donated, you know, big amounts, you know, they'll put your little name up there and stuff, you know, that you're helping to work towards getting new carpet for the sanctuary or something like this. That's carnal, completely carnal. You know, it's not a God. That's ridiculous. But that's what happens in a lot of these places, and that's what these scribes and Pharisees are doing. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. But be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Okay, again, you see a couple things there. Okay, first of all, when you are praying, I would... First, I'll say this. I would avoid avoid any kind of a prayer, national prayer day, or any kind of a thing like that. I'd avoid that thing like the plague. Okay, And unfortunately, a lot of these prayer meetings at the Babel buildings I've gone to, and I remember this one, you know, I'd go there, and it was, there was this couple there, and there was a woman, and, and her daughters were all going to Ivy League schools, and it was like, you know, does anybody have any prayer requests? Oh, yes, sister over there. Um Please pray for my one daughter. She's in Harvard, and uh, you know she has a big test coming up here. And, and my other daughter in Yale, and she's uh, you know has this going and that going. And and my other daughter, she's in Princeton, and uh, carnal, completely carnal. You know, watch out for some of that stuff. And then you get this these guys too. They'd stand up and they'd be like, they do this big act. You know, when they're when they're praying. You know. And so, Oh God, we come before you in humble 
submission as we stand here really truly unworthy to to even call upon thy name holy father you know you know watch out for some of that stuff you know and then there you know i've been around people too and you'll you know there some guys praying and and these other people are just go oh jesus thank you jesus oh lord oh god thank you god oh god thank you god thank you jesus oh thank you while somebody else is praying shut up okay what are you doing you know watch out for that stuff and of course the thing there are vain repetitions i have a, a you know sermon about that you know this thing of um can't you remember what it's called common scripture misconceptions is what it's called i forget part one or two but i talk about the thing of some people they you know want to pray and they say you know uh, please lord help my brother sam to get saved and then they pray again and they say please lord help my oh i can't repeat the same thing there i guess please um lord help sam to be saved someday okay next day you know please lord uh about Sam helping to be saved. You, know, you don't have to mix up your prayer every single time you pray, okay? Why? Because it condemns vain repetitions, not repetition, all right? Vain repetition is, you know, oh, Holy Mary, Mother of God, you know, Father, blessed be the fruit of the loom, whatever. You know, that's a vain repetition, all right? That's what's being condemned there. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 after this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts for, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear uh, unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They get the praise of men, that's their reward. Um, but thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So you see there the thing again of not being a man pleaser, okay? What you do for the Lord, it's not to be hypocritical. It's not to get, you know, be so that you can get the praise of men, okay? Let's go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 5. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? What about this thing of ministereth the Spirit, John chapter 6, verse 63 says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh prof profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are light. Again, if you're listening to ministries that don't really preach the word much, uh, they're not really ministering to, to you the spirit. All right? And a lot of times that stuff gets really, really fleshly. The more you stay away from this book, the more your flesh will rise up. And you get these guys, these carnival preachers, a lot of times... And they're just telling stories the whole time and putting in neat little anecdotes and whatever else and nice little, you know, lessons and morality lessons and whatnot. That's not it. That's missing it, okay? It's the book. And when you listen to preaching, they should be quoting, the preacher should be quoting a lot of scripture, all right? This is the thing. There ministereth to you the Spirit through the pages of the King James Bible. But uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 6. Let's go there next. 6 through 9, we'll read these verses. It says here, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham? And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And these shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Now I want to cover something here which is uh, very prevalent among a lot of the brethren. They say that Abraham was saved the same way that we are today. You know, Now, Abraham had a lot of things that were similar to us today because he was before the law. All right, I understand that. And it was by faith that he was saved. But what was the faith in? Romans chapter 4, verse 1. Go there in your Bible. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. 
Okay, it says here, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, God would owe you salvation if you could work your way to heaven. Verse 5, Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay? Now, what was Abraham's belief and faith in? Okay? Let's look at that. Go back to Genesis chapter 22 in your King James Bible. Genesis chapter 22, uh, verses 3 through 8. We're going to see this thing, what uh, his belief and faith were in. Okay, it says here, And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now, if you know the rest of the story there, we're not going to read the rest of it, but God actually sends a ram in the thicket, and he says, hey, don't kill your son. But the fact of the matter is, um, was Abraham saved the same way that we are today? Well, in the sense of faith, he had faith in what God told him to do. He had faith that God would provide himself a lamb. And, of course, that's a prophecy there. It's very interesting how it's worded there. God will provide himself a lamb. Jesus is the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Very interesting. So there is a prophecy given there. But if you just said to Abraham, uh, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved? He just said, who? Well, Jesus, he died on the cross for your sins. You believe that, right? He's buried, rose again the third day. Abraham would have said, huh? What are you talking about? But if you just said to Abraham, well, let me explain. You see, God the Father sacrificed his son to pay for our sins, and his blood is what cleanses us from all iniquity, all sins. Abraham would say, oh, wow, yeah, okay, I get that. That really happened. Boy, God sent his, his own son. Wow, that's really neat. See? Abraham had in type, he was justified by faith, okay? But it was not the same salvation that we have in terms of what he was believing in. God told Abraham what to do, and Abraham had faith that God was going to take care of that situation, but Abraham did not have faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That was a mystery that had not happened yet. And see, what a lot of people try to do that are non-dispensational, they'll say, see, the Bible says that Abraham was justified by faith, so he was saved the same way as we are today. No, that doesn't work. Abraham was saved by faith, but it was a different faith than what we have in terms of faith in what is happening there. Okay, He could not have faith in Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ had not yet died on the cross. That's why when Jesus Christ was here on the earth, you read about it all throughout the Gospels, he's saying to them, I am, I'm going to go die on the cross. And they're going, huh? You know, he says it to Peter, and Peter goes, be it far from thee. You know, no, well, no, I don't agree with that. Well, if they were getting saved by looking forward to the cross, wouldn't they have said, well, obviously, yeah, Lord, I mean, we're, we're saved by looking forward to the cross. They didn't know about it, okay? So don't fall for that lie, that deception, that everybody in the Old Testament was saved the same way as we are today. That is not true. That is a non-dispensational lie. Don't fall for that. And that's another thing that they'll do too, by the way. They say, well, see, Abraham was justified by faith, so then everybody from Moses the whole way up to the Lord Jesus, they were saved by faith too. No, it doesn't work that way. Abraham is before the law, Okay, there was no laws of Moses that were there for, for Abraham to live by. 
Okay, so after Moses comes and the laws are given, now they're justified by having faith in what God is telling them to do, but also by keeping those laws and that system of animal sacrifice and the, the Levitical priesthood and everything else. That system is now there. Okay, so you say, again, prove that. All right, you get the guy that, uh, you know, is walking out and he goes and he picks up some sticks on the Sabbath day and God, bam, drops him, kills him dead. Well, did he have faith in Jesus Christ? Did he have faith in whatever? It didn't matter what faith he had. His works, he disobeyed God, and God dropped him. And I don't believe the guy went to heaven either, by the way. You know, See, it's a different system. You have to get the distinctions in the Bible, in the King James Bible. There are different dispensations. That's so important to understand that. And it's called heresy by a lot of people out there. That's because they don't understand the Bible. This stuff scares them. Okay? Let's try to make the whole Bible teach the same thing, and it doesn't. All right. Going back to Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. We'll read those verses here. It says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Okay, you can go next to the book of Acts chapter 15. I'm going to show you a couple more things here. All right, Acts chapter 15. All right, and like I said, the book of Galatians is all about these Jews trying to get Christians back under that Old Testament system of law. You got to be very careful with that thing, you know, for salvation. In other words, Acts chapter 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. See, they were still holding on to the Old Testament. Verse 6, And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when, they had made, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago uh, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purif purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, now look at this, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? They couldn't live under the law. They couldn't live perfectly without sinning. Verse 11, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. Okay? Interesting because I think that this event actually is happening and we're reading about it over here in the book of Galatians. Okay? You see the thing of Paul there going up to Jerusalem to meet with them and they're discussing this thing of are we justified by the law? Should we keep the law? You know, they're discussing that thing. And they're basically saying... We couldn't keep it. Why are we going to try to force it on the Gentiles? This doesn't make any sense. Very true. But let's continue here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. It says here, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through uh, Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, what is the blessing of Abraham? Well, Genesis chapter 22, verse 8. We read about it earlier. God himself will provide a lamb for, for the burnt offering. Okay? That's what the blessing of Abraham is. All right? Jesus took our penalty for sins upon himself when he died on the cross. You know? I mean, it'd be kind of like uh, you just robbed a bank 
and you're running out of the bank with the money in your hands and a police officer gets up behind a car and goes like this to shoot you and Jesus Christ jumps in front of you like this and, and he shoots and Jesus gets hit, hit with the bullet. All right? He just took your penalty. You were the one that deserved the bullet, but Jesus Christ took it in your place. We all deserve to die a horrible death for the sins that we've committed. But Jesus Christ took our sins upon himself and said, okay, I'll pay the penalty here on the cross. Praise the Lord for that. Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abram, Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. Now I believe it's talking there about the Abrahamic covenant, that God promised to Abraham and his descendants there, you're going to get a certain piece of land. And it's not spiritual, symbolic, you know, that it's actually, uh, you know, British Israelism with uh, the UK and America and Canada, you know, the United States and Canada. That's ridiculous. Okay, don't fall for that. That's nonsense. Okay, it is a land over there, the nation of Israel, the land of Israel, Jerusalem. All right, you can study that whole thing. But that Abrahamic covenant cannot be disannulled. It is something that is an everlasting covenant that God made with his people. Nobody's going to come in and say, well, yeah, but the Jews are rejecting Jesus right now, so they don't get the land. Sorry. Nope, sorry. It's a physical piece of land, physical inheritance for a physical, racial people. Just the way it is. Galatians chapter 3, verse 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Okay, the law has been done away with, but God's promise has not. God still has a promise to those Jewish people for that land. Galatians 3, verse 19 and 20. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Okay, question. Who is our mediator? All right. Who is the one that is our mediator? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He is the one that is our salvation. You know, he's the one that, that took our penalty uh, for sins on the cross. Galatians chapter 3, verses 21 through 25. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise of by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Okay? What is the purpose then of the law? The Ten Commandments, essentially, in this passage here. What's the purpose of it? It is to show us that we are sinners. That we have no ability to save ourselves with our own self-righteousness. That's the purpose of the law. It brings you to the place where you are a broken sinner and you realize, I can't, I don't have a chance of saving myself. I better somebody find somebody to save me. Okay? I better find a mediator. And Jesus Christ is that mediator. That's the purpose of it. Okay? Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You know, we talked about, you know, one of the previous studies talked about the thing of the hidden man of the heart. You know, Christ in you. 
And uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized, it says there in verse seven, uh, 27, excuse me, Galatians 3, 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, Romans 6, 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Okay? That's why you are called a Christian. All right? Uh, if you are from Mars, they call you a Martian. You know? Um, it's just, we are Christians because we have Christ in us. We are part of his body. Okay? We are connected to Christ. And when you, I mean, we've talked about this before in the other studies, so I'm not going to cover it again here. But the fact is, when you get saved, you have now a power within you, the Holy Spirit of God, that can help you fight the lusts of the flesh. You don't have to live the rest of your life in those sins. Very important to understand that. Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. We'll finish these last two verses here. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. And uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, we'll read a couple of verses here. If you want to go there to 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 1 through 4, says here, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith, with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Remember what it said there in, in, I think it was chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, about uh, how he delivered us from this present evil world. It says there, given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You know, that's a wonderful thing. And you know, it's hard sometimes to remember, especially when you see this world going downhill like it's going. But you got to keep in mind, we're going to get this world one of these days. After the time of Jacob's trouble, we're going to come back here, and Jesus Christ is going to be ruling and reigning in Jerusalem, and we as saints are going to be ruling and reigning with him. So, you know, when you look out at this world and you see the people that have the bigger houses and you see the people with the nicer vehicles and, and you really dream of, boy, I sure wish I had some land and I wish I had this and I wish I had that, realize that you're going to get that in the Millennial Kingdom if you suffer for him, if you suffer with Jesus Christ, I should say. If you suffer, you'll also reign with him. So it's very important to spend your life serving Jesus Christ. Okay? Very, very important. Don't get caught up in this thing of having to go back under the law and trying to keep the law and trying to, you know, just keep yourself saved. Okay, uh, I, I've often found that people that try to keep themselves saved uh, never get much done for the Lord because there's just no time to. You're, you're trying to keep yourself saved. Uh, that's, that's a mistake. All right, serve the Lord with your life. Stay focused on eternity. I, I just can't say that enough. I mean, it, it's just, I don't know how much time we have left before we're called out of here, but uh, the time that we do have, I know it's it's just, it's so important right now to be witnessing as, as many opportunities as we can get. Um, put out tracts, put out coins, you know, gospel coins, I'm saying. Um, I've showed those in other studies. Uh, I mean, there's so many things that you can do to distribute the Word of God. Uh, as if you saw one of the other studies there, it talked about um, God's Word does not return void. You can't waste your time uh, putting out tracts, putting together videos. Uh, I mean, just preach the word. Uh, be instant in season, out of season. You know, I mean, we are supposed to stay active for the Lord in the time that we have. And don't let somebody try to get you pulled back under the law. 
that was going on back here in this book of Galatians, and it was messing people up. Okay, so much so that Peter or that Paul actually went and rebuked Peter to the face, rebuked him in front of everybody, not because he was trying to make fun of him or anything like that. He was just saying, "Hey, this is this is serious. This is a serious business. You shouldn't be saying these things." Okay, so stay with the Word of God. Don't get sidetracked on uh, things here of this earth. Um, stay focused. And uh, I guess that's going to be it for this week. Let's cl close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, again for the challenge from your word. Uh, your word is just so living and so true, Lord. There's nothing in it that's, that's truly archaic that we don't see everywhere in our world today. Uh, we're seeing so many things, Lord, that, that just line up with the scriptures and and uh, the dangers, Lord, are, are ever present. Uh, none of the dangers that are mentioned in the Bible, uh, none of those things uh, are just gone and in the past. We can see all of them today. And I just pray, Lord, for all the Christians out there, the, the Bible believers, that they would stay by their convictions, that they would not back down, um, but that they would remain strong and uh, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, that they would learn to put on the whole armor of God and uh, that they may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, it's really some bad times out there, Lord, and I just pray that they, your saints would, would uh, spend their time uh, seeking ways to serve you and to witness for you. And I pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that's going to be it for Galatians chapter 3. Uh, join us next week for Galatians chapter 4. And uh, we'll continue from there. So thank you very much for watching.